Charles Whitman, Part 2. Monday, July 6th, 1959. He did it. Charlie was finally on his own. Well, he was technically property of the U.S. Marine Corps, but he was away from his father, so it felt like freedom. Transitioning to military life was smooth. Charlie was a natural for the Marines. He had practically been born holding a gun in each hand, and he didn't have the homesickness that many others had. Serving in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, he began his military training and service miles ahead of his peers. He was at the top of his class without much effort. He tested and earned his sharpshooter badge. Shooting at moving targets and at long distances was his thing. Charlie had friends and healthy competition in the Marines. He was fit, focused, and was in a better mental environment than he'd ever experienced in his own home. When he reached the height of his training and classes, it was clear that he had gone as far as he could with his enlistment. He needed to become an officer. FBI interview with redacted Marine number one. Charlie, quote, had attended the University of Texas as a student under the Marine Corps Naval Enlisted Scientific Training Program, the NESTP. Whitman, after agreeing to an extension of his obligated service time, was sent to the University of Texas for four years, free of charge, and upon graduation was to be commissioned as a Marine officer. Close quote. Charlie was offered a scholarship to attend the University of Texas, where he would study mechanical engineering. Classes, books, housing, and spending money were gladly furnished for their future star officer. The investment in Charlie, the Marine, was a no-brainer. Friday, September 15, 1961. Charlie arrived at UT with big goals. But now that he was back in the States, Charlie was a bit out of his element. All of the things that he had excelled at during the last two years were not useful here, and his structured flow during his service was gone. 20-year-old Charlie Whitman was truly on his own for the first time. His requirement at the university was to do well in his classes and graduate. The Marines were keenly aware of Charlie's intellect and expected college to be a breeze for him. Everyone expected that. Instead, Charlie quickly became overwhelmed and began struggling to keep up. He couldn't shut off the expectation that had been built into him that he had to be perfect. Charlie kept a diary wherein he frequently wrote worried notes to himself and self-directive goals. The thoughts in his head were telling him that he needed to be the top, the best, the ideal everything. He wasn't used to this scholastic-only life. And he wasn't used to being around peers who didn't have his strict, regulated life structure. Perhaps somewhere in his mind, having been accustomed to do exactly what he was told, exactly when he was told to do it, he looked to those around him to see what he should be doing. They were being social. He became social. Charlie engaged in activities like scuba diving and karate, and he found that he was quite good at both, especially karate. And, of course, he was drawn to hunting. It was part of him. It was natural. Charlie and his friends went hunting one day and made the not-so-smart decision to bring a deer back to the dorm. The deer carcass left bloody stains across the dorm all the way to the shower, where Charlie was using his knife skills to do the things that are done to animal carcasses. That did not go well. In the FBI's interview with Father LaDuke, it was written, quote, While Charlie was in the Marine Corps stationed at the University of Texas, Charlie was apprehended by the Game Department of the State of Texas for killing a deer at night and bringing the dead deer to his dormitory at the university, leaving blood stains from the entrance of the dormitory room. Charlie gutted or skinned the deer in the shower. According to Father LaDuke, the incident was widely publicized in Texas and the only explanation Charlie gave Father LaDuke was to blame it on a teenage prank, close quote. Okay, here's the thing. I have to interject with what I think happened there. I think once he had some social situations around other guys, he bragged that he was a Marine and an expert marksman. He wasn't, but he was really good. And how would they know if he was trumping up his accolades? I think he got some attention 
His ego was stroked, and the more he talked about the things he could do, the guys got into testosterone mode and started talking about hunting. I think they got there, and Charlie was able to easily impress the others. That feeling was intoxicating. They were young, barely out of their teens, away from home. I picture Charlie picking up the deer like a sack of potatoes and shocking the guys by saying he'd go do carcassy activities with the deer back at the dorm. What? No way. Yeah, of course. Let's go. Grab my bag. Wait, seriously? I gotta see this. I think the friends knew that it was sketchy to bring a dead deer into the dorm, but Charlie was in the mode, and he was not one to back down. They were fascinated, and I think he was equally fascinated by their shock and awe. Okay, back to the story. Charlie was having fun, and he was doing pretty well as a student when he set his mind on finding someone he could spend his life with. He'd been called a playboy in high school because he was handsome and the girls loved him, but he was also very reserved and respectful in dating. Only four months into his schooling at UT, Charlie was blown away by Kathleen. She was everything he could possibly have hoped for, and their attraction was mutual. She was 18, following through with her educational goal to become a teacher. July 19, 1962, Charlie proposed to Kathy. August 17, 1962, Charlie and Kathy were married. Strangely, or at least it's strange to me, they married on his parents, Charles and Margaret's, anniversary. Kathy's parents paid for everything for their only daughter's wedding. Charles wasn't in charge there. He hadn't paid. So he and Margaret stayed to themselves at the wedding. Married life began with Charlie withholding from Kathy that he was struggling to handle everything. He had taken on small side jobs to get loving gifts for her, but she didn't know that. He didn't want her to know that he didn't already have everything he thought she deserved. Charlie couldn't focus, and he wasn't interested in what he was studying. Kathy knew how hard he was working for his classes, but she didn't know how stressed he was. February 1963. The Marines withdrew Charlie's scholarship, citing less than acceptable grades, and ordered him back to active duty to complete his enlistment. He left for Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, leaving his wife of only six months to complete her education. The two of them would reunite when she graduated. Life as an active Marine was not as amazing this time around. FBI interview with Redacted Marine No. 1 Quote, Whitman was an unusually nervous sleeper, and if awakened from a sound sleep, would sit up erect in bed, hands cocked, ready to fight. Close quote. Charlie had grown accustomed to a free life, having fun with friends, trying different hobbies, and being with his new wife. On base again, one of the things that Charlie dabbled with was gambling, along with all the guys. It wasn't allowed, but people turned a blind eye around it. It wasn't a huge problem, and basically everyone was doing it. November 1963 The story goes that a fellow Marine owed Charlie $30. Today that would be about $273, and he demanded an additional $15 in interest, $136 today. The guy said no, he wasn't going to pay interest, probably with a laugh, and supposedly Charlie changed the guy's mind by pulling a gun on him. Guns were strictly controlled on base, of course, but this was his own personal gun, which he unlawfully carried on to the base. It was reported Charlie was court-martialed. FBI interview with Redacted Marine No. 1 Quote, Whitman had been court-martialed for lending money for profit in violation of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Whitman had loaned money to another Marine to go home on leave. Upon his return, the borrower was to pay Whitman the money back, plus some interest. The borrower then reported Whitman to the military police, and he was arrested. Whitman told him several times that if he ever ran across the man who turned him in, he would belt him. Close quote. The book, The Texas Tower Sniper, explains that Charlie openly confessed to carrying an unlawful gun on base, to having that gun with him while previously on the USS Raleigh, to carrying ammunition for an M14, to gambling, to lending money, and charging interest on it. 
However, it is said that he did not admit to threatening violence with the gun he pulled on the other Marine. Charlie's rank was demoted from Lance Corporal to Private, or E3 to E1. He was sentenced to 30 days confinement and 90 days hard labor. When his enlistment was up, he got out of the Marines. There are a few reasons why I don't believe the story about Charlie pulling a gun on the guy who owed him money. At this point in this story of Charlie Whitman, I think the truth starts getting hazier as we search for a purpose for what ultimately happened. FBI interview with redacted Marine number one. He, quote, stated that Whitman felt that the Marine Corps had been wrong for removing him from UT and was of the opinion that he had made satisfactory grades. Whitman had written a letter to the Dean of the University of Texas. The letter was answered and indicated that Whitman had received satisfactory grades. The interview goes on to say, Whitman knew that even though the letter proved that his grades were satisfactory and the Marine Corps was wrong, he could not return to the NESTP program since the court-martial precluded his becoming an officer. Close quote. From all accounts, Charlie was quite nearly the image of who you would want as a Marine. He would be the guy you'd want your daughter to marry. You would trust him to do the right thing. He was severely abused into perfection. He had a B average from the University of Texas, yet the Marines pulled him from his program. Before he could get them to see their mistake, he was court-martialed. That court-martial ruined everything for him. I do not believe, based upon his overall previous behaviors and based upon what others said, that Charlie would recklessly risk his future for something as dumb as threatening a fellow Marine with a smuggled gun. I think the story was either highly exaggerated or completely fabricated. Charlie did lend money to others, that part we know, and it fits. He'd been helpful to others around him, always. He was a people pleaser, and the court martial just doesn't make sense. Along with redacted Marine Number 1, who said that Charlie had been reported for usury, there's a website, honoluluguy.com, where a former Marine, Dennis Keating, talks about his friendship with Charlie. Quote, Charlie and I served together and were friends at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, in the 1960s. At that time, I may have been the only Marine outside of the Judge Advocate Department and Charlie's chain of command who actually read Charlie's court martial documents. I personally felt Charlie got a raw deal. I felt someone had it in for him. The so-called crimes were minimal. I believe 90% or more of the Marines, including myself, were guilty of one or more of these offenses. If the higher-ups chose to do so, we all could have received a court martial. I continue to believe Charles Whitman was screwed by the Marines. Close quote. I doubt there's any way to prove it at this point, but I believe Charlie loaned money to someone as he'd done before. I think he asked for the money back, the guy didn't have it, and words were exchanged. Maybe Charlie threatened to report him for something, and the other guy didn't like that threat, so he did it first. I think this is when Charlie started being taken over by his inner turmoil. His life had always been a series of staircases he ascended until he reached the top. Then he moved to the next staircase. He'd been beaten severely into being perfect, and he was very self-conscious about the way others saw him. Now, suddenly, he lost his school scholarship and he was court-martialed, never to be eligible for the officer he was destined to be. This, I believe, is when the monster inside of Charlie Whitman began to grow.